I think is where we, we ended up, if I remember. And I, I talked about, you know, Abraham traveling from over here um, in this section. Uh, when he lived there, the Sumerians and a group of people called Chaldees, and, uh, and you know, he was in Ur, U-R, and he left Ur and his family, and this is how he traveled all the way over to the, to the Promised Land. And remember I told you the reason he traveled this way, see the rivers? Everything was fertile here, a lot of production of food. Um, and so there were roadways and ways to get there. He couldn't come straight across. This is green, but it's not really green, if you know what I'm saying. Um, the term that is used, and you won't find this in your, in your Bible, but uh, it's, it's called Mesopotamia. It's the uh, geographical term for it. Egypt's over here. And um, here's another map showing this group of people up here were called, you know, the Haiti, and uh, I'm going to show you some other groups in a minute. I think I got the map on here. Um, and remember I told you this is Asia up here and Africa's here, and you see this little strip of land where the Holy Land is, it's a land bridge. So if armies are going to move, they can't move through the desert, this is how they move, right through Israel. So there's a road that runs through Israel, and some of y'all have been there, it's called the King's Highway, and uh, it's still there today. And the reason it's the King's Highway is because it's the means of transporting military and stuff, you know, through that area. Um, the uh, Hittites, or Haiti, is a, it was the other land that you saw. The, the Hittites, you see them in the Bible. Uh, this is what area they're from. The Assyrians, and we'll, we'll go over some, you know, rough dates on that. This is background cultures that existed. Then Babylon is where Israel was carried into captivity to start with, over here. But this is where Abraham came from. Um, so really when Israel was captured by these people and carried back, now for that to happen, the Babylonians had to conquer the Assyrians. And when they conquered the Assyrians, then they controlled all of this, the Fertile Crescent, and then they were able to uh, come back into to Israel by means of the same way that Abraham did. Okay? Now, our Old Testament, you'll see these um, empires coming up, and then you'll see Syria over here, and you'll see these countries, and this is where they were then. They don't exist now. This would be uh, modern day uh, Turkey would be over here. This would be some of the uh, southern parts of Russia, and this would be, of course, um, Iraq, and uh, then a little bit further to the east would be uh, uh, Iran, okay? Uh, here's another map showing basically the same thing, and then it adds, you know, some of the other names that you'll see in the Bible, uh, Assyria, and then Babylon, and then they conquer them, of course, the Hittites. Um, now, this is a pretty good map that I had a hand-drawn thing that I usually use, but this is a more colorful map. Um, if you look at the geographical situation in Israel, you have what is referred to as the coastal plain. That would be right along this area here. Now, I've never been there, but some of that part on the coastal plain looks like the low country. It has marsh areas and things like that. Uh, but the coastal plain, this is flatter, runs almost, and as you get, you notice the elevation, it goes up as you get more to the north. But this area down here on this side, the Gaza Strip today, is where the Philistines lived along the coast here. They were a seafaring people, which means they lived off the sea. Uh, fish was a big commodity. Uh, their idol was half fish and half man. His name was Dagon. And you'll see this popping up as we get into the Old Testament. This was kind of the arch enemy, you might say. Remember, David had to fight the Philistines and Goliath and all that stuff. They were one of the last groups to be conquered in these tribes that they, you know, that they conquered. We're going to, the Central Mountain Range, you can see the color here. Um, and there's a, shows you a, kind of a graph. Here's the ocean. Here's the plains. Here's the Central Mountains running through the area. And then, of course, you got the, uh, uh, what they call the Jordan River Valley or Jordan Rift right here. And then you've got the wilderness area to this side. 
But the Jordan Rift, Rift, you start up here, see how the color is? You start up here around 5,000 feet and you go all the way down till you get to the uh, Dead Sea and it's the lowest point on the earth, 1,290 feet below sea level. So if you're at the beach, imagine, you know, standing on the beach and looking down into a hole that was almost 1,300 feet deep. That's how low it is in the Dead Sea. And that's, that's basically why it's called the Dead Sea is because there's no outlet. If water comes into a basin and has an outlet, then you get fresh water in there. But because there's no outlet, it's just like a And, you know, I feel that's been in the Dead Sea and just let water and just float. Interesting. But this is uh, the southern portion. So you go from high, you know, basically a high, pretty high altitude up here all the way down to, uh, you know, the lower. Uh, yeah, it can, well, the river, yeah, well, all of this drains from the mountains, all of this drains down the river and comes in here, but you got to remember, with that much water, and you'd think it would fill up and run over, but it doesn't, because of the temperature, it evaporates, and uh, so it, it just stays in there, and, you know, it just gets replenished by the river, which drains into it. This is the River Jordan. And if you were to look at the upper portion coming out of Galilee um, and, and looked at the river, there's little marks here. It's like this. And when the river, it's been said that when the River Jordan, uh, you know, begins, some of that feeding into the Sea of Galilee, of course, uh, there's places where it's not very wide at all. And then as you get closer down here, you can see the color. It's a little bit wider. And remember Joshua... When he brought the Israelites over, he traveled, you know, from Egypt out in the wilderness and came in the back door and crossed over up here where Jericho was. So they had to travel through all of this and come up here. And when they got to the River Jordan, it was uncrossable. And that's when the ark, God instructed Joshua to, you know, to send the ark ahead and the water parted, just like the River Jordan, I mean, uh, Red Sea. And uh, it's interesting because in the seminary, you know, they, they go through all the explanations of what could have happened. And some of the people in their books said that, you know, there was a, a earthquake and temporarily dammed the river. And uh, I said, well, if you follow that, it, the timing was what they needed. And I said, but then who unplugged the river? So because it started flowing again after they went through there. <laughs> you know, people's always trying to come up with logical exp explanations. And you say, well, why is this important? Well, to me, visualization of what you're reading is so much a part of understanding what these people went through. And, you know, there'll be other maps that I'll show you. Uh, and I'm trying to give you background so that when we get into the, some of the texts and stuff, I'll refer back to some of these things and say, remember how I told you that, you know, for example, the Central Mountains, Jerusalem, is located up in here. So it being located in this area here, it's... It's west of the River Jordan, but it's in the mountains, and it's built in such a place that, you know, with the walls around it, it's a pretty good fortress. In fact, it took the Babylonians a long time to finally, they've come under siege for months and months and months before they finally was able to break it down. And it's located, you know, on the King's Highway, so it's a, it's a very uh, centralized location that, that God placed them. And, uh, and then, of course, the Sea of Galilee, you know, you're 70, 80 miles up here. This is where Jesus did a lot of his ministry here in this area, you know, the fishermen and all that stuff. And over on this side uh, was the area that in the days of Jesus, jumping ahead, uh, the Greeks had settled uh, through centuries of, you know, empires changing. There was a Greek area that's called the city, the Ten Cities or Tecapolis. And that's where Jesus went over there and crossed Sea of Galilee, and he went over there and healed the guy that was possessed with 2,000 demons. They threw the demons into the pigs. And, and then he came back across here. Well, this sea, and, you know, I've talked to Glenn and some of the others that, you know, because of you got this desert area and the hot winds and things coming across this, and, of course, you got the winds coming and meeting across the water, and you got evaporation, you can have violent storms on that sea almost, you know, any time, certain times of the year. 
So those storms you read about in the Bible were real that Jesus talked about. And, uh, you know, and if you've ever been on Lake Moultrie, up Lake Moultrie, um, Santee, you know, they're more shallow than Clark Hill. So if a storm comes up, the waves are a lot higher because the water gets up. And I was out there one day fishing with some guys from St. George and, and, and we were hugging the shore just to get back to the cove. And I mean, the water was coming over the boat and, and, and the wind was blowing like 20 miles an hour. But when Hugo came through there, big old boulders that they had all around the dam were being thrown around like pebbles. The water was throwing them over the dam and part of the Army Corps of Engineers had to come in there and replace a lot of the rocks. I'm not talking about big boulders. And they said you could go on the other side of the dam and see where the water and the wind doing Hugo had thrown them stones like somebody throwing pebbles over the top of the dam. Uh, you know the situation in New Orleans where uh, when the back side of the storm came through on Katrina, it wasn't the storm on the front side that got them. The flood came from Lake Pontchartrain and it pushed over the levees. And that's what caused the flooding. Well, they were saying here if that storm had lasted, it moved pretty quick through there, Hugo, something like 20 something miles an hour, so it didn't. But I heard people talking about later that if it had been a slower storm, there's a good chance it could have washed out the side of the dam where all them boulders are leading out to this, this concrete structure. And then of course you would have had floods all the way down to Charleston. But, you know, but anyway, you know, getting back to this, uh, this is the area. And then of course, this is the area where John the Baptist was on this side of the river later on. But during the days, you know, before the New Testament, there were some settlements along in here. And if someone left Jerusalem, to go up here to this area, they would come over here, cross the River Jordan, travel up this side of the River Jordan, and come in the back door. And you say, well, why did they do that? Well, in the Old Testament, somewhere along in here is where the line is, and we'll see it later. The Assyrians captured those ten tribes to the north, and later on, there was no one there, and the people that got named there were called Samaritans. And the Jews considered them unclean, because they had come under the judgment of God. And so they would not travel through there. Jesus said he went through there, but they didn't want to go through there. So traveling was kind of not through this area here. It was more to the closer to the River Jordan to get from here to there. And uh, it's kind of interesting how people looked at things. All right. Um, this is just showing some of the Dead Sea area. This is from the space looking down at how the River Jordan feeds into, into the Dead Sea. Uh, this area here, they refer to it as the Transjordan. You know, I called it the wilderness, but it's just across the Jordan. Uh, in modern day today, uh, on the West Bank, which would be this side of the River Jordan, is where they're having a lot of the issues because... Part of the concession that Israel made years ago was to give up some of this land for Arabs to settle in on the, on the West Bank. And then the other thing is, through time, Israel took some of that back. So there's still a lot of tension there. And of course, you've got, you know, the border and stuff like that between them and so forth. All right. Um, let's see. I'll save that to later. Here's some, some of the pictures. Valley of Jezreel, Yarmuk River, Gilead. Y'all probably have seen some of those. That's not what I wanted. I was trying to get back to my, might have to go to the second one, I will. All right, any questions about that so far? Or? Let's see, that's not the one I want either. Alright. Alright, this is just some few notes that I've gotten put together. Um, just to kind of give you a background of some of the information. Um, the historical background, Old Testament begins with creation. That's when everything started. The Hebrews begins with the patriarchs. 
and the patriarchs is from around 2000 to 17 BC. Patri, or patria, means father. Ark is a ruling. So this, a patriarch is a ruling father. So these would be the ones like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they would be the patriarchs or the ruling fathers of the Jews. Abraham from Ur, land of the Chaldees, from around 2000 to 1700 BC. Uh, then of course his son Isaac, and then Isaac had Jacob, uh, which name was changed to Israel, 12 sons of Jacob, and then of course the youngest one uh, was Benjamin, but Joseph was the one that carried him down into captivity. Gail's been reading a book called What Was It, Women of the Bible? I don't know if y'all have seen that on Fox. She, she said, it, you know, she's studied this all of her life. She's taught Sunday school, and she said, this book puts it in a different perspective that the women of the Bible, you know, you, you hear about all the husbands and things like that, but this lady brings out the reality of that situation. And she said, it's just, she said, how did these people live under God's direction and they had so many issues, you know, with family. For example, just like, you know, Jacob here, we'll see this later, uh, you know, who was his first wife, Rachel? And, and, and then he couldn't get Rachel, so he had to take Leah, his sister. Yeah, I'm talking his first, but I'm saying the one he wanted was Rachel, is what I meant to say. But he had to go back and serve again and, you know, I was told from the Hebrew that Leah basically means cow face because she was very ugly. Rachel, Rachel was more, I mean, I heard that when I was in seminary. And he didn't want, Ra he didn't want, he didn't want Leah. He wanted Rachel, but he had to serve, what was it, 14 years to get Rachel, counting the, the seven. So anyway, you know, that situation. So when you look at his wives, they were slave, you know, maidens, you know, stuff like that. And so these 12 tribes were made up not from just one mother, but multiple, you know, mothers. And, you know, we can't comprehend that kind of culture. But that's who God spoke through was Abraham and then all these that followed. And, you know, God used them, which gives us hope. Next time you get down on yourself and think, well, I'm not good enough for God to use me. Just read the Old Testament. He can use anybody if you're, you know, express, you know, faith in him. Of course, the exodus um, happened. Joseph, if you remember, I'm just doing a summary tonight. Joseph, you know, ends up down in Egypt because his brothers despised him. Um, he ends up down there. And then, you know, the story of Joseph. And we'll come over that in more detail. And uh, that's where uh, eventually Israel goes to get food. Joseph helps them. And so they live there for 400 years or so. Then, of course, the exodus is the 13th century, about somewhere around 1,280 years when they left Egypt, and that's approximation. And of course, the Red Sea, the Mount Sinai, the wilderness, geographically speaking. And then after that, after the, um, that period of time in the Bible, the Old Testament picks up with the period, period of Judges, a very difficult time of survival. Of course, they've come into the Holy Land now. They're having to fight all these tribes that are there and reclaim the land that God gave to them. And God raises up people like Gideon and Deborah and Samson, Shamgar, uh, you know, it, it follows Shiloh. Th those whole, the book of Judges is a, an interesting book because it shows Israel without a king. So there's a lot of struggle going on in, in that situation. Then we come over here to um, the next section, three, the United Kingdom. The king's line of order of succession. Who was the first king of Israel? Mm -mm. Who was it? Y'all know because when I say it, you're going to say, I knew that. Saul. Yeah, Saul. Uh, not Paul. Saul. This is a different one. Uh, king Saul. Uh, from around 1020 down to 1000 B.C. Okay. David, king in the south, was the first at Hebron. It was the beginning of a dynasty, the king of the United Kingdom from around 1000 to 960 B.C. And that would mean the northern tribes and, of course, the southern tribes were all one then. And, you know, he was the king. Um, then, of course, Solomon came after that. He was the builder of the temple, started forced labor. Here's some of the contributions. The temple commerce gave Israel international standing. 
set up court systems, sponsoring wisdom literature. The only problem is he was not too good with his own personal life, fell into the culture of the surrounding area. If you were a king, it was a, a popular thing to show your wealth, to be able to possess women. And they were used as, um, you know, commodities to share and trade and so forth. And, uh, you know, he boasted of having how many wives? A thousand. Uh, I think 700 concubines. I call them porcupines. Uh, 300. But, but women at that time were considered property. And so these kings, including Solomon, uh, would fall into that trap. But the trouble was they began to spiritually take Israel away from God because with that many cultures of people coming in, uh, they influenced him. So at the time of 922, um, Solomon uh, dies and the nation of Israel splits. And that's where you get first and second Kings and the Chronicles and all that. And when we go through some of that, I'll show you that. But that's kind of an outline of what's happening. Israel breaks up. And it gets confusing for us because you'd be reading your Bible in the Old Testament and you read Israel was under attack and then you say Judah was doing this and they're both in the same passage. And, you know, for a long time, you know, for me before I started getting a bigger picture, it, it was confusing to me because Judah was one of the 12 tribes. But when the 10 tribes got displaced and were living their own lives, they were called Israel at that time. The southern two tribes, which was Benjamin and Judah, took the bigger name, and they were called, of course, the tribe of Judah. So they were separate. The kingdom split when Solomon died. He had two sons that, that basically tore the nation apart. Jeroboam took over the ten tribes to the north. Rehoboam, more conservative with the temple in Jerusalem, took over the south. And that's the reason why, to me, a lot of people get confused is because some of these names of Israel change back and forth. And as I've told you before, your Bible is not chronologically written. So when you get to these historical passages, they overlap and they jump back and forth. And if you want to get a chronological Bible, uh, you can. I bought one one time, then I got rid of it. Uh, because it did do that for you. It took the kings and put them in the right place, the prophets with the right kings, and, you know, Israel versus Judah and put them all in the right place. But you might read three or four verses here, then read a chapter, read three or four verses from another book and trying to keep up with it. And they'd have some Psalms stuck in there, and then they'd have a little bit of, you know, Ecclesiastes stuck in there and some of the, uh, you know, Psalm, I mean, uh, Proverbs. And, and your mind's going, well, that's not how I was raised. So I just said, I, I can't relearn all that. Now, if you start teaching somebody that at an early age, and that's how they understand their Bible, I could see that. All of us were raised with the first five books of the Old Testament called the Torah. Then we have the, uh, you know, the, the historical chronicles and kings and all that. Then we have the wisdom literature, Psalms, you know, uh, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. They're grouped together. Then we have four big prophet books. You know, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, you know, Daniel. And then we have what they call the 12 minor prophets. So they're grouped together like that. But what I'm saying to you, if you stood back and broke all them verses down and had a calendar or, you know, a thing marking out history, then you could actually plug those things in there. And, and what you would find, you'd be taking some from here to there. And that's what they call a chronological Bible where they do that. Uh, for us... Um, we break down portions and read it, and we actually, you know, unless have to get aids from biblical to understand where does this fit in. Now, if you do this long enough, before long, and this will happen, and you say, I'm too old to learn. Well, you know, you're not too old to learn, in my, my opinion, because you've got basic background now. If you start seeing the big picture, and it might, the light might come on for you, You'll start seeing certain key dates. 922, Solomon dies. What happens? Kingdom splits. Prior to that, who was king? Well, of course, David was. And then you can go right back on up to Abraham. Well, after the kingdom splits in 722, right here, guess what happens to the northern kingdom? 
The Assyrians come in. Remember I told you Assyrians were up here? They come in, take ten tribes. Basically, they're, they call them the ten lost tribes of Israel. There's still remnants and heretics of God's going to bring all of them back in the end time. But the point being, the, the northern kingdom is gone. Judged by, you know, God used the Assyrians to judge them. Southern kingdom, Judah, Jerusalem, they're carried off into captivity around 587. So they don't live too much. I mean, they don't exist too much longer, but they get to come back. Okay. And because the big tribe was Judah, they were called Judahites. That's where we get our, our English word Jewish from, from the tribe of Judah. And because uh, they couldn't, I like them ites on there, you know, termites, Hittites, Amorites. All that is is a plural form of the particular people that, that, that were living there. All right, let's move on real quick. All right, so you have Saul, David, Solomon, 922. Now look what happens. Now you have northern kings or kings of the north. And you have southern kings. And then the, the north, there's 21 kings in 200 years, down to 721. In the south, you have 21 kings in 350 years, and they break up the kinghood in 587. All right, so you got two different ones. Now, uh, also, you have prophets to the north until they fall. Jeremiah, I mean, not Jeremiah, but of uh, Hosea and Amos. They're the two prophets to the north. To the south, you've got the prophets like Isaiah and uh, Micah and, you know, a few of the other ones that are there. So they'll mention these kings that where God is having them serve. That's in your Old Testament. And when we come across them, I'll refer back to this. The Davidic line, which is the line of David, was still on the throne in the south. And in the north, there were various different families. Ahab, Jezebel. Y'all remember some of those names, you know? Uh, reasons for the divisions. Uh, I won't go through all that right now, but there were some reasons why they... A lot of it had to do with money and the policies of Solomon. He got too big for his britches. And the people resented the north because they were having to send everything to build the temple. They were having to supply the military. They were the larger of the ten tribes, so they were being basically milked. Uh, you know, of course, there was tribal loyalties. The geography, south more secluded, north was in trade routes. Lack of unity, fear of dictatorship because of Solomon's strong policies. And, of course, look at here, Solomon's sins was probably the biggest of all of it. And uh, I just said he got too big for his britches. He's a wise man, but anyway. So there were two, two different temples. You had the temple of Dan and the temple of Bethel in the north. This is where they did some of the sacrifices to the false gods and things like that. Um, Southern kings, they got some I mentioned here. Northern kings uh, there. Let's come over here. All right. And this shows you Asa was a good king. Jehoshaphat, you know, popular religious reformer, friend of Ahab, which is to the north. And Basha. Omri did more for stability against Samaria as the capital father of Ahab. And uh, anyway, you can see some of the contrast. Now, the next thing I wanted to mention was, how many of you read in the Old Testament about Baal? Right? Uh, give me some feedback. Who was Baal? As a pagan god. Any information about what you learned in Sunday school or anything? Just some facts that you saw the Bible. God didn't like them. Y'all y'all believe that? He was against the Baals. All right. Um, here's the books. First and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, Leviticus, Love Thy Neighbor, and all those things fit into this time period. Um, the Baals essentially were a religion, and it was and it existed when, when they came back from crossing the Red Sea and when Joshua led them into the promised land, the tribes that were all there, even in the south and the north. It was interspersed with these groups of people that their religion, their belief was that everything that they did was based on how prosperous they could be with their animals, with themselves. And there was a religion that existed that came all the way from the land of the Chaldees and still existed. Uh, fertility gods and goddesses. And so everything was connected so that they built temples to these false gods. 
and at times sacrificed their own children. And in so doing, by paying homage to these gods and bringing their goods to these gods and even sacrificing their babies to these gods, in turn, the priests of those religions would guarantee to them prosperity. More animals, more children, uh, weather conditions would be better, bigger crops and all of that stuff. So they were tied in to a group of people that already lived this way. And through time of attrition, Israel found itself falling into this because this was what was popular. Now, compare that to today. What similarities do you see today that what's happening to us right now with Christianity versus these other religions? It's attrition. You know, people we grow up with, we have kids, they go off to school. I call them pagan schools. They come back and they don't even believe in God. Or if they do come back, they got a different mindset than what we grew up with. So each generation gets watered down. And that's what happened here. And the 10 northern tribes, because they had two rival temples, they had a lot of paganism. But still, the south can't, you know, they still, as you read uh, Isaiah and stuff, they still were involved in it. And this Baal crisis literally uh, ripped at the heart of Israel because they were pulling away from God and turning to the false gods and practicing things that God's word clearly says is sin. And because of that, God brought judgment upon them. So you'd have a good king. He'd go in, clean up the mess, tear down the temples, you know, stop all the, the craziness. And then he'd live maybe 30, 40 years and it was prosperity. And all of a sudden his son would come into power, take them right back to where they were or the grandson, take them back even further and then you go along and then all of a sudden here come another king and he'd straighten it out, you know, back and forth. The northern tribes, uh, you know, basically went downhill all the way to 721 and they went out of existence. Ahab is a very familiar name to, that we're a member of and so forth. Now, during the Assyrian era, when the northern tribes disappeared, Syria came down from the north. And you remember Assyria taking all these ten tribes and basically annihilating them. Uh, in the south, uh, God spared Judah. You know, they could have come on in there and took Judah, but God miraculously defeated the enemy and kept them from coming because it was not God's plan. But the ten tribes, you know, you remember the story uh, of Jonah, the town of Nineveh? You know why he really hated to go to Nineveh? Because this is after Nineveh had, you know, conquered the ten tribes. They were a people that Jews hated. Because they were looked at as the ones that Assyria uh, had basically wiped out. And so they were enemies of Israel. And Jonah had bitterness in his heart. But God loved these people. It's, it's a very classic story about missionaries and, and God loving people that you think he can't love. And that's the thing that and Jonah said. He'd rather be thrown over and eaten by a fish than going to do what? I mean, that's how strong he felt about it. And at the end of Jonah, what happens? After God delivered the city, what did he do? He went to Nineveh, he, he to Nineveh but, but he still wasn't a happy camper because when he got outside the city, he was sulking oh, that God had spared him, you know. Because in his mind, he was like a lot of people said, Why, how can you not punish these ungodly people? But the book of Jonah is, is really a story of God's love and grace and, and showing how Israel... Uh, was his chosen people, but they were to be a light to all nations, not just themselves, you know. So it's kind of a, a missionary story. Um, I'm going through this pretty quick because when we go back over it, we'll have more detail. Um, in 735, there was a syro Ephraimic war. Uh, the Ephraimites uh, joined with Syria to fight the Assyrians. You know, remember they had conquered the other ones. 722, the north fell to the Assyrians, population deported. And this gives you some reasons why the north failed. And the south, Hezekiah, first king after the north fell. Uh, and it, you know, then Manasseh, the worst king that Israel ever had. You probably read about his name. And then Josiah comes behind him, and he's a great reformer. He's the one that destroyed what? The Baals, restored the temple. And he died prematurely in battle with the Egyptians. And then we have the Babylonian period. You see, you didn't know so much history was in your Bible, but it's, it's loaded with stuff. And the Babylonians come in at the Battle of Carchemish, 605 B.C. The Assyrians are completely wiped out. 
The Assyrians fought the Babylonians and Medes. The Babylonians defeated them. And, of course, they came in, surrounded Jerusalem. They did not destroy it. The prophet Jeremiah and Ezekiel are there when all this is happening. Uh, and so we have the prophets there. Uh, and 586, literally burned into the ground, took the Jews into exile, including the king. Gedaliah was made governor over Jerusalem. And at this time, you have a massive exodus uh, of, they call it the exile, of Jews who are carried into captivity over to Babylon. So there's just a very few people left in the city. The temple is completely destroyed. Uh, the walls are torn down. It's a really a bad place for anyone to be surviving. Jeremiah survives all of this. God delivered him. And according to what we read over in the book of Hebrews, you know, he basically escapes and comes out into Egypt where, as far as we know, that's where he died. Um, Persian age. They come up against the Babylonians from 550 to 530. Israel's in captivity. They've got Daniel over there talking to them about God. They've got Ezekiel over there prophesying, telling them it's going to be okay. God's going to deliver you. So when you read the book of Daniel and you read the book of Ezekiel, it's talking about the future restoration of Israel. But it also has stuff about the end of time in those two books. And so they are hearing from these prophets about God bringing them back. 520, 515, book of Nehemiah, book of Ezra. Nehemiah the cupbearer comes back. Remember, he asked the king, Persian king, because he was his cupbearer, favored him. God used that situation. And uh, he's able to come back. Ezra is the priest. And so when you read your book of Ezra and you read the book of uh, Nehemiah, they worked hand in hand. Nehemiah rebuilding the city. Ezra rebuilding the spiritual foundations. That happens in this time frame here. Now, um, then... Following that, here's the Judahites. They're called that from then on. And then, of course, our version is Jewish. Uh, the Greek period, which is, starts around 300-something uh, uh, B.C., Alexander the Great, Jews were persecuted by the Seleucids, Maccabean revolt. They fought against them. And then they had their freedom all the way down to 63 B.C., before Christ. At that time, the Romans defeated uh, the uh, Greeks, the Mac Maccabeans were, of course, defeated by Herod. And then we come down to the time of Christ. And at that time, the Romans in power. So that's a real quick synopsis that when we go back over this and start going through the books, I'll, I'll make a reference, jog your memories, and hopefully somewhere along the line, I call it a spine. In your brain, you'll see this spine. So that when you're reading, see, this happened to me. I'm reading the book of Nehemiah. I'm thinking Persians. The Israelites were being held by the Persians. The Persian king, who considered himself king of kings and lord of lords, uh, God took him and said, yeah, you can go back and anything you need, Nehemiah. And they started rebuilding the city. Why? Because the prophets had already said it's going to happen. So God used ordinary people. You see what I'm getting at? Or if I come down to uh, the time when Solomon was ruling, that's around 922 years before Christ, you know, he dies and his two sons take over, split the kingdom and, you know, all of that. Um, now, the world of the Old Testament, it's a small area. We've been looking at fertility, mixed a variety of farming and herding, northern kingdom interspersed with trade routes. And we've already looked at the four geographical areas. OK, I'm going to stop in just a minute. We went over some of this last week. Or two weeks ago, I should say, because I pre appreciate Brother Finley doing. You did the New Testament last week, right? Good, good. Um, you have the Torah and the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch means five books. That's what that means. Torah is the Jewish way of talking about the first five books, which means law, because it contains much of the Jewish uh, law. And then you have the section called the Prophets, and you have earlier prophets like Joshua in Judges 1 and 2 Samuel and so forth. Uh, the latter prophets, major and minor. Uh, you have writings, psalms, wisdom literature, uh, little scrolls, uh, Ruth, Esther, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. And, and then, of course, by the time you get to 400 B.C., most of what we know in the Old Testament was finished. Prophets by 180 B.C. 
were accepted as being a part of the Old Testament. The Psalms and everything else kind of came later, but far as the Old Testament in the days of Christ, it's what we have today, which is really fascinating that you can go that period of time and we still have what they had. And, you know, that was their Bible. All right. Now, I'm going to bring next week, I have a Hebrew Bible and let you look at it and pass it around. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of this. But the, he the, the Bible's written in Hebrew with a little bit of Aramaic. Some of the passages have little phrases of Aramaic. Hebrew, and if, I wish I should have brought it tonight, but I just slipped out without it. The Hebrew Bible, if you look at it, you go all the way to the back to find Genesis. Genesis starts on the last page, and you move forward. So in Genesis, on the last page, which way do we read? From left to right or right to left when we read it? From left to right. Well, in the Hebrew language, you read from right to left. So you go to the back of the book, start on the right side, and you move back to the left. Move back to the left. It's, it's difficult. When I, when I took Hebrew and had to translate, I, I, it's just for a long time I was going, something's backwards about this, you know. But <laughs> you have no, no vowels, only consonants, and there's 22 of them. And they're funny-looking characters. You have to remember you're in Eastern countries, and most Eastern languages over there, when they wrote stuff and recorded it, did the same thing. Started from the right, went to the left, and had funny little symbols and stuff. And uh, you could leave out one little dot and change the whole verse. So when we were given a little, you know, for tests, they'd give us a little passage of Hebrew. And it would be copied. And sometimes it looked like one of the dots was faded out. And you couldn't tell if it was a dot or a yod or a tittle. And I'm going, you know, if I, if I put this down, I know I can find that in my dictionary. But if I put this one down, it means something else. And, and then you begin to realize when people started copying these things how easy it could be for somebody to make a mistake. And yet we have manuscripts that match up all the way back in very few places like that. That, that should say something. It's almost like God is watching over, yeah, after he dictates through the Holy Spirit what needs to be written, he protects it. So today we have a chance to hear the gospel and hear the truth and to hear the Old Testament history. Uh, you know, based on these these languages and stuff. Um, I'm not going to go through all that, but you see you have Greek and Syriac, Latin. There's different English, I mean, different uh, language translations. Um, let's see. All right, now, here's the question. How does the Old Testament speak to us? You know, for a lot of people in Family, you probably know some preachers, they don't even preach out of the Old Testament. They just, you know, throw it out and said it was just, it was Jewish history, it didn't have much to do with us. Um, but how does the Old Testament speak to us? So here's the approach to the Old Testament. Um, it needs to be biblical, it needs to be an honest struggle. And what that basically means is, is that I've always been taught the Bi let the Bible interpret the Bible. And if you read the Bible and you study the Bible, you soon find out that the teachings about what truth is uh, surfaces from the Bible into your heart. And you confirm it from the text and that reinforces in other texts the same thoughts. It doesn't, in other words, you don't read in one book, that book this is what, how God operates, and then over here read another book and it's completely opposite. It's consistent. And I think that's the word I'm looking for, that when you start Genesis and you come through the Old Testament, you know, the history, though, it's mixed around, like I said, there's consistency there, you know. And God even says that of himself. I'm the Lord thy God. I change not. You know, we come to the New Testament. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today and forever. And yet here we are in the 21st century and people try to interpret the Bible and say, well, that doesn't speak to us. It doesn't have any relevancy for us. And, of course, uh, I disagree. Now, here's some facts that keep in mind. The Old Testament stories or narrative deals with historical events. You read the book of Genesis. These are stories about patriarchs and their children. Um, 
there's some pretty rough stuff in there. There's some situations that if that happened today, it, it would be in the news, you know. Uh, <laughs> it would be, you know, it would be a scandal, you know. And, and yet, these are God's people, you know. To me, what Abraham and Sarah, they're playing to, you know, they couldn't have kids, although God told Abraham's going to have kids. I mean, her plan to, you know, have a handmaid and all this stuff uh, messed things up. And we're still dealing with that today. But, you know, God still used these people to bring Christ into the world uh, and to give us salvation. But historical events, biblical view of Revelation, and we're not talking about the book of Revelation. The biblical view of how Scripture is revealed, it is a revelation of God. Word and event, the event has a meaning or purpose of God. Probably the best story, and you're familiar with it. What did Joseph tell his brothers after he, you know, he finally told them that he knew who they were. They knew who he was, you know. He said something like, y'all meant it for evil. But what did he say? God meant it for good. Now, go back and read the chapters preceding to that statement. And Joseph is in a hole, out of a hole, sold to slavery, not slavery, accused of raping Potiphar's wife, you know, you know so forth, forgotten, left in prison. And you, you're reading this story and you're going, this poor dude, you know, why does he even bother to serve God? It's just, he gets one knock down after another and then his brothers show up and they're the ones that sold him into slavery. Now, like I said in my message this morning, you know, he could have easily had a vengeful heart. And, and, and held a grudge against them and said, you know, off with your heads, you know. And, and people that knew him said he would have been justified. But because he had God's heart, he looked at the bigger picture and he said, you know, Israel needed to be fed. Israel was hungry. And I'm already in place. And I'm in charge of all the food of the only place on the earth at the time where people are surviving. Do you think that's coincidence? No. How does that have a purpose for us? We, like Joseph, yeah, we, like Joseph, may have ups and downs. But if we're people of faith, we can see the good of what God's doing. So it's a story, a true story. You know, what he says, it has a meaning. Um, I won't go into the critical tools, the intent of the narrative. What are they proclaiming? The purpose of all kinds of narratives is to get to understand its purposes. Um, for us today, and there's a big term, interpretation, what did it mean for them, historical context? We're going to do some of that. And I'll show you that when you're reading a passage, for example, the book of Leviticus. I know every one of you in here, at least I've heard since I've been here, and it's typical in every group of Christians. They, they read the book of Leviticus and they scratch their heads and they say, I'm not reading this anymore. <laughs> I just, I'm confused, you know. Um, so you say, well, what, what, why was this book written this way? And what was the, you know, what's the, well, to put it in short form, we'll go over it more later. The short form of it, it was written because these people were ignorant of how to live some of the, how to live their lives with some of the basic things we have to go through. Hygiene, personal hygiene. They didn't have anyone to teach them some of those things. They've been in the wilderness forever, you know. And, and so God gave to them, and I see in the book of Leviticus, instructions about personal hygiene. I see in there uh, instructions about human sexuality. A man shouldn't lie with another man as with a woman because it's an abomination unto God. Duh. So what did that say? They were exposed to that through these other religions and out of Egypt, which was common. So there, human sexuality was defined that marriage is the way and so forth. That's in there. And then what about the sacrificial system? And the sacrificial system, you know, was pointing to the cross. And God was preparing these people that, hey, in this world, sin has to be paid for. God's wrath is against sin. And sinners who are not have their sins covered are going to face judgment. And when you bring that into the New Testament, Christ took all of the Old Testament, bore our sins, bore our penalty. But for them, it was the beginning, and God used that. So it's full of how the sacrificial system, and it was very, you know, specific about certain sins. And uh, there was one sin called the sins of the high hand. Have you ever heard that? It was the sins of the high hand. And I didn't understand this for a long time until I started watching TV and I saw Iran and some of these other countries in defiance of America. They put their fist up like this and their arms, their wrists are 
do it. You've, you've seen pictures of that, you know, when they're like that. That is an ultimate defiance of showing the wrist down to the elbow against your enemy. That you know that you're right and they're wrong and no matter what they tell you, you're in opposition to them. Now, the Bible says God's sacrificial system didn't cover the sins of the high hand, which meant that a person in their pride could say, all right, the Bible says I shouldn't do this. God's word says in Leviticus this is sin, and I don't give a rip. And so you're... And coming under God's grace, you defy God. Today, we call it the sin, unforgivable sin, you know, sin of unforgiveness. You know, the, what do they call it? The what? Yeah. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit. The Pharisees did that. They knew he was God. They knew that he couldn't be doing the things unless he was God. But in his face, they claimed he was doing it in the name of the devil. So they basically were putting up their high, sins of the high hand. Well, the book of Leviticus explains that. And, and there are, you can't be forgiven. And the very fact that you have a desire to be forgiven shows you haven't committed that sin yet. But that, so, so the book of Leviticus, just in, just in a quick summary, was kind of like a textbook to the nitty gritty. How do we do this thing called being God's people in a sinful world? And it gets pretty explicit. Gets pretty, and it's also dietary laws, things they could eat and not eat. Pigs. Does anybody know about pigs and parasites? What about people around here eat pigs like you're coming out your ears? I know I had some yesterday. Uh, what do you have to do with pigs different from other animals? You have to make sure it's cooked right. Uh, why aren't cows a little different? You know, you can eat a, a, a almost a raw steak and it not bother you. I like my steaks medium rare. Uh, God says, as long as it's not walking through my plate, I'll eat it. You know, but uh, the thing is. They needed instructions because guess what? In that culture and society, that was one of the main meat foods for the other tribes around them. And uh, so they were taught very early, stay away from it. Unless the hoof, you know, it's not split. Stay away from it. And that's why they did that. So it's dietary thing. Remember when they came into uh, captivity and Daniel in the first book of Daniel and his three friends? What were they eating? A whole lot of different food, wasn't they? And they were healthier and stronger and stuff. Mostly a vegetarian thing. Fish and things like that. So... So the thing was that God through the book of it. So when you look at it like that and go back and read it, say, oh, I, I get it. But then there's some things in there that say, I don't get it. I'll be honest with you. It just, just doesn't fit. And it's because I'm not in that culture and I don't understand the purpose. Okay. So uh, what does it mean today? Well, we can gather some truths from every one of the books. Uh, conclusions may not be certain. We'll raise questions and people you know, don't study it that particular way. Um, I'm not going to go through all that. This stuff here is really uh, just speculation. I call it pure speculation, but uh, it's a way that they've studied the scriptures to decide, you know, who wrote them and all that stuff. We're not going to go through all that. All right, now, uh, we'll start with this next week, and I'm going to go back to my other outline because it's over there. Uh, Genesis 1 through 11 is a narrative of stories, story of the youth of humanity, simple, plain, direct, God in a concrete way, very real stories, not abstract, set up the need for the covenant promise with Abraham. So this first 11 chapters that we, you know, we're going to look at, if, if you take that out of the Bible, you don't have a Bible. What do you mean? Well, there are people who are saying the first 11 chapters are Genesis, or Genesis itself is a myth, and we don't need it. Take Genesis out of the Bible, and you don't have a Bible. Genesis, which means beginning, explains how we got here, how we were created, but it also explains how we sinned against God, and it prepares the way for the purpose of Jesus coming into the world, dying on the cross, and the whole nine yards. It's right there. So next time someone tells you Genesis is a myth, it's saying, I'm afraid you're wrong, my friend. It's, it's the foundation of the Bible. Everything else is based on what starts there. Um, so we'll, we'll look in detail as we go through that. I'm going to stop there, uh, see if you have any questions. 
Um, it can be on anything, but I mean, the, the Old Testament, but y'all got anything? I know I went through that kind of quick, but that's not where I'm going to spend all of my time. I just want you to see there is a, a flow of history. There is a flow of uh, patriarchs. And these people you're reading about walk this earth. These people that we're going to be looking at and uh, the begats, all the begat people, they're in there for a reason. Um, I've always said if you get your name in the Bible, it's either a good thing or a bad thing. And unfortunately, there's some of them in there, it was a bad thing. <laughs> Uh, you know, but then there's a story like Rahab, complete turnaround. You know, that's a good thing. But then stories like Judas, it's a bad thing. But anyway, uh, when we go through some of these books, I hope to get you to see the picture of how it's put together and, and see these people in a different way that maybe you've seen them before. And uh, so it takes some time. But like I said, we're not going to spend a lot of time on dates and stuff like that. I don't do that. <laughs> do what? Well, I'm, you know, so, I mean, that's confusing. That's confusing. It's confusing. You read Leviticus and then go to mm -hmm. the Well, it's like, yeah, shrimp. You're not supposed to eat shrimp. You know, they're, they're kind of like the bottom feeders and stuff. And uh, I've known some Christians that won't eat shrimp because of that, based in Leviticus and stuff. Um, crustaceans, things of that nature. Um, I feel sorry for them, you know. So you know what you were saying, then, that was for their culture. Part, that's, the, that's, that's the part that, that what I'm saying is for us today. How do we take what God instructed to them then and apply it to our dietary laws today? And what you brought up was a good point that he told Peter when he brought the sheep down three times. I made these things. It's okay to eat them. You know, um, you know a hungry man will do, eat a lot of different things if he's hungry. And what is tied to most of the things God specifically pointed like the organs I know this for a fact that those pagan religions would use those organs to interpret the future. They would use the animals for different meanings when they cooked them and all this stuff. And part of that was staying away from that so they wouldn't be identified because if they told them, you know, you need to eat this heart or this liver or whatever, and it'll give to you strength from the gods, you know, then God says, no, I know you could eat that, but I want you to stay away from it. It's like blood. You know, he, he, he forbade them to, to eat anything, you know, full of blood and not to drink the blood. Um, Jehovah Witnesses take that literally, and they won't even take a transfusion now that means life and death because they include that in their teaching. That's one of the biggest things. That's why they won't go to a doctor and get medical help or any kind of infusion uh, even though it may not even be a blood product, they don't want anything stuck in the veins that could break that commandment. Uh, there again, that blood that was poured out from those animals was used as a sacrifice, life in the blood. God was trying to teach them the sacredness of blood. There again, preparing them the blood of the lamb. But yet the pagans had no problem drinking it, had no problem sacrifice, you know, doing something with it. So, to me, that I see that. Uh, but there's some things in there, and I'm not get into all of them, but there's some areas in there that, you know, I see as hygiene, like I said, dietary, uh, spiritual, uh, truths, you know, shadows of things. Well, feed me gizzards. I just don't ride on back. Yeah. Now, Gail likes gizzards. That's my favorite What, a gizzard? Yeah. Well, Grandpa told me, you know, he grew up poor, and... His mom and daddy died early, so he had to be farmed out to one of his uncles. And since he was like 10 kids, he's the one. He had to do all the farming and stuff and quit school and never finish school. And he told me, he said, for a long time, he didn't know a chicken daddy didn't have anything but a neck <laughs> or a feet, you know, feet. And he said the first time he knew it had legs, he, he didn't know what to think. And he said, then when he found out it had wings, he said, you know, he said, because. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them agriculture farm, man, when it got tight, you know, and 
you got a kid now that's not your kid and you got nine kids that you brought in this world. Grandpa said it was, he was treat, mistreated sometimes. Uh, he had to do a lot of the labor that those kids would go off to school and he had to stay there and take care of the farm. But his mom and daddy died, so what's he going to do? You know? And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thankful for the time we live in now. I know all the, I like the chicken breasts and the wings are okay. I was a wing person, but uh, I like good old chicken breasts, and I've never eaten a chicken neck. And gizzards, I don't, I don't handle gizzards. We got a friend of ours down in uh, Somerville. We go out to eat, and there's this one restaurant cooked southern food. <laughs> and he said, bring me that plate of chicken livers. I looked at him, I said, you kidding me with steaks on the table and seafood and stuff, and you ordering a plate full of fried livers? But he's from West Tennessee, one of them poor farming communities. That's probably the only part of chicken he ever saw growing up was a chicken liver. Uh, but anyway, we'll, we'll go through some of this, and we'll take our time. And uh, I, I encourage your questions. There's no ridiculous questions. Um, uh, there'll be things that come up, and, you know, I still have questions. I know Finley does, so we all do. So, all right, let's, let's close in prayer tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for your love and mercy and grace and for the things we study in your word that we don't understand. We thank you for those who've gone before us and laid the groundwork so we can glean from them and then trust your Holy Spirit to give us insight to thus saith the Lord. Help us to be faithful this week. Help us until we get back together again to be safe and keep us safe, Lord. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.